Think of who you think you think you are, then think again. Think of who you think you think I am, then think again. Now we have John Bradshaw. John is the brands director for Lion Nathan. So what he is doing sober here on St. Patrick's Day, I do not have a clue. John cut his marketing teeth on brands such as Milky Way, Guinness and Smirnoff. So he's a healthy man. <laughs> Uh, before being overwhelmed by a desire to grow a beard and buy his own island in the Caribbean and abseil off an assortment of large objects. Instead of doing that dream, he went to work for somebody who does, uh, and John joined Richard Branson's Virgin Group in early 2008. Now he's the uh, Lion Nathan brand director, though, so um, he's going to be the person I'm following to the after party. Please make him welcome for his 15 minutes of big thinking. Thank you. The only way to compete historically has been to create sustainable, desirable, leverageable uniqueness to strategically differentiate your brand and business. And as the world moves ever faster, that need becomes ever more paramount. But there are three problems as I see it. First, the world's becoming increasingly competitive and increasingly homogenized. Second, the old sources of competitive advantage are being eroded. And third, there's a new market force in town and it's called employee power. How do you create sustainable, desirable, leverageable uniqueness when the world's all the same and your employees have got you by the balls? Well, I'm going to introduce you to a bunch of characters um, to help us on our journey. Let's look at that first problem through the eyes of The Economist. Welcome then, Adam Smith, author of The Wealth of Nations in 1776 and father of modern microeconomics. And the first thing I learned from Adam when I studied economics at business school was the notion of perfect competition. Now, for those of you who haven't studied this so-called science at university, perfect competition is an imaginary state where there are no restrictions to the demand or supply of any good or service. So ludicrous, in fact, we used to laugh about it in economics class. Well, that's not strictly true. Nobody ever laughed at anything in an economics class. But whilst Adam Smith's assumptions of perfection seemed absurd to us, in the 1990s, nowadays we're seeing conditions closer and closer to that ideal. As globalization, the rise of the interwebs, and the emerging third world economies take hold, the markets that you and your clients and your competitors operate in are becoming increasingly perfect. And the problem with perfect competition, as the economists in the audience will know, is it eats supernormal profit. By definition, it removes competitive advantage and it erases strategic differentiation. So much then for Adam Smith. Strangely, prophetically right, um, but unsurprisingly for an economist, no use whatsoever. So let's turn to a 20th century thinker. Welcome Michael Porter, Harvard Don. And I'd just like to say, thanks Michael, I've built a career as a strategy guru on the back of your thinking. No surprise then that I turn to you as I look for the elusive secret to modern day differentiation. And no surprise, you purport to have the answer. Three of them, in fact. Michael suggests there are only three sources of competitive advantage. Cost leadership, focus, and differentiation. Let's take each in turn. Cost leadership. OK, that's not looking so good for my Sydney-based first world economy business what with the emerging markets of China and India, and God forbid Africa should ever get its shit together, and India starts to look like an expensive place to base a call center. <laughs> so cost leadership's not going to work for us. And as I think about focus, I'm also struggling, Michael. Focus used to mean finding a geography or a market segment where there's little or no competition and owning it. Well, the damned interwebs have gone and buggered the geography thing. I can buy anything from anywhere at the click of a button. And when we talk about segment focus, everybody tells me, and by everybody I mean those of you in the audience trying to sell me digital marketing services, everybody tells me it's all about the segment of one, the power of the individual. Well, that's awesome for me, the consumer, but downright bloody irritating for me, the, at this point, slightly flailing strategy guru. And let's turn to differentiation. And I have to be honest, Michael, I've always struggled with this one. The firm strategically differentiates itself by differentiation. No shit, Sherlock, sign me up for a Harvard MBA. I'll do the tautology specialism, please. 
So it seems the man from Boston's finally let me down, and he doesn't have the answers either. And just as our performance is in the toilet, our executives are on the sick with stress, our brands are screaming for investment that we can no longer afford, there's a third problem. Meet the new boss, the Uber boss, same as the old boss, the globally mobile, empowered employee. If you thought it was hard enough meeting the needs of the shareholder, the stakeholder, the customer, the consumer, the competitor, wait till you see what this new bunch of fascist overlords have got in store for us and our by now frankly sickly looking profit and loss statement. I'm going to reenact a conversation for you that's happened for real in some of the largest organizations in the world over the last 10 years, but I'm going to fictionalize it to protect the guilty. Let's meet our third and fourth difference seekers, Anthony and Jeremy, <laughs> two senior executives of Mega Big Advertising Corporation. Anthony's the CEO, and Jeremy is the head of their US operations. Their telephone conversation yesterday may have gone something like this. Hi, Ant, it's Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy, how are you? What can I do for you? Well, Ant, let me cut to the chase. I met with our top 30 people yesterday, and, well, they want 30% of the business. What? Yeah, I met our 30 most talented people yesterday, and they say, unless you give them 30% of the business, they're going to leave tomorrow. What the f... Yeah, and I've been thinking about it over the last 24 hours as well, and I'm pretty talented. I'd like 2% just for me, or I'm out the door tomorrow as well. You bastards! So now we're really in trouble. We've got three problems. Perfect competition's real. Michael Porter's sources of competitive advantage are not. And our employees are, frankly, revolting. <laughs> it seems that competitive advantage no longer exists on those things we used to rely on. Implementing Six Sigma. Getting our social media strategy right outsourcing everything to Somalia or any of a dozen different ideas we can buy from BCG or McKinsey or, God forbid, the account planning group. They're not bad ideas. In fact, I'd argue they're necessary, but they're not sufficient. You need them in your business, but then you need photocopiers, coffee machines, and toilets. And nobody's arguing that they're making you strategically distinct. Hey, stock exchange guys. Stop looking for another bailout. Come and look at my fab new set of armored shanks urinals and my Xerox machine. Now will you upgrade my stock? I don't think so. So how do you find that elusive point of difference? Well, maybe given this is the battle of big thinking rather than the battle of repeating somebody else's thinking, we need an original thought. The problem with original thought, of course, as Lincoln pointed out, is that it's even more fictional than Anthony and Jeremy Michael's sources of competitive advantage, or my career as a strategy guru. But I do have a solution. It's not exactly a new idea. It might not be a big thinking idea. You'll be the judge of that. But I do believe it's the only idea in town worth thinking about. The only thing that will make you win, to help you stand out in a sea of amorphous brands and products, to help you change with, not against the world, is unlocking the intellect, talent, motivation and loyalty of the people in your business. The answer to being different in 2010, I believe, is how you attract, develop, retain, and inspire your people. And the beautiful thing about people is, they are, barring some advances in cloning technology we might hear about later, unique, sustainable, desirable, leverageable, and above all, different. Your people can mark you out as different. And if you think that's easy, ask yourself if the following sounds like something you've ever heard in your business. Does your HR director say, people are our greatest asset? Do you call it human capital? Well, I say nuts to that. Like John Merrick and his less good looking partner Rosso, I'm not an asset. I'm a human being. People are not an asset, a tool, a resource, a means of a production, or a part of a process. They're unique, they're individuals, they're different. I'm nothing against HR directors, by the way, but then 
I've nothing against the people who clean those strategically differentiating toilets I talked about earlier. I just don't think they're necessarily the best people to be in charge of your last bastion of competitive advantage. So what's the answer I hear you cry? Well, the trouble with differentiation is that it needs to be different for each business. That's kind of the point of differentiation, folks. If I were to, I refer you back to that MBA and tautology I've got earlier. If I were to give you the things all businesses should do the same in order to be different, I'd also need an MBA in oxymorons. However, here are four things to consider that may help you put people at the heart of your strategic thinking. First, make people the top of your agenda, from the CEO up to those toilet cleaners. The old adage is true. The fish rots from the head. If it's not the CEO's all-consuming obsession and passion to manage the talent in your business, it's not your strategy to put people first, whatever it says on the poster in the wall of your HR director's office. My current boss, Mr. Branson, says it quite well. At Virgin, employees matter most, because happy employees lead to happy customers. And happy customers, at the end of the day, mean more profit which leads to happy shareholders. And to me, that seems like the right logic flow. My second thought is to change the model. The problem with the shareholder model is that in the main, the shareholder doesn't work for the organization. They expect the organization to work for them. Adding a shareholder value and adding employee value are not the same thing. In fact, they're often in conflict. Why not give some? or all of the company back to the people who have the chance to mark you out as different? Why not buy 30% of your shares back and give them to your top talent? My third thought <coughs> is around flexibility. Meeting the needs of those individuals in your business. Now, as your business gets bigger and bigger, I understand that it's increasingly hard to tailor the needs to thousands of employees. But as a marketer, it's been drummed into me by those people in the audience trying to sell me digital marketing, that we've got to move the conversation from one to many to one to one. And if I can dream that dream about millions of customers and consumers, surely I can dream that dream around a few thousand employees. Imagine asking your staff exactly what it would take to unlock their motivation and loyalty and just giving it to them. And my fourth point is to invest in management. And I know, the point, I know the vogue is to talk about leadership. And don't get me wrong, this is all about how you lead your organization, but people need managing too. Buckingham and Kaufman said it best, I think, in First Break All the Rules. People leave managers, not organizations. It's not your induction program, your performance development process, your office environment, or your vision statement they leave. It's their boss. It's the quality of coaching and development gap. It's the relationship they have with the person at work who's most important to them, their manager. Imagine if we made people management capability the capability we prized most above creativity, strategic thinking, and all those current things we say are important. So that's it. It's not simple. In fact, it needs to be as different as the people who make your business. But I do believe if we build our strategy people first, if we genuinely put people at the heart of our strategic thinking, if we make people our vision and intent and do it with a real care for the people who can stand out and make us different, then I believe we'll do something that most businesses are struggling with. We'll make a business that's different. Just as Adam Smith and Michael Porter are writing their acceptance speech, leaning back and having a self-congratulatory fag, the Oscar goes to Karl Marx and the communists in the most unusual way. It does, however, take two Swedish economists to point it out. The workers, says Carl, should control the critical means of production. The critical means of production is small and gray and weighs about 1.3 kilos. It's the human brain. I've been John Bradshaw. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, John. That was uh, fantastic and uh, a very inspirational quote from Richard Branson there, although there wasn't quite enough space on the, uh, the screen to complete, th there was a little bit left in that quote, it ended with, unless you're a woman over 40. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> but yeah, the broad gist of the start of the idea I think is really good. <laughs>